Fala, galera! Chegou the main event of the evening. Chegou a hora de trocar uma ideia com Ken Rubin, um autor best-seller internacional, uma das grandes referências no mundo em transformação ágil. E a gente vai trazer aqui em primeira mão para que vocês tenham a oportunidade de entender como que o mundo pensa a respeito de transformação ágil. Então, cruza os dedos e vamos lá! Hello, Ken! Tiago, how are you? I'm fine, and you? I'm doing well, thanks. I appreciate you having me here today. First of all, we are very happy with your presence today. It's a pleasure to have your knowledge being shared with our students, for our students. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you again. I'm, I'm glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Ken, the Agile methodologies are getting more and more famous around the world. What have made the Agile way of thinking so important for the companies? It's a great question to start with. Uh, to me, the world's become much more fast paced. And the assumptions that underlie a lot of the older software development life cycles, they're just not valid in today's world. We're moving at a different speed. Uh, they make assumptions about things not changing. And we know that in the world in which we operate today, things are constantly changing. It assumes we can get things right on the first day when we have the worst possible knowledge we will ever have. Again, these assumptions just tend not to be valid. Years ago, when the world was a bit different, perhaps they were a better fit, but not today. And we need a framework that provides for learning. Uh, speed of learning, in my opinion, is a very good correlation with the level of success that a company will likely see. And I would also offer that the reason it's become more and more likely that companies will adopt Agile is Agile's actually crossed the chasm. So for the listeners who have maybe read Jeff Moore's books, one called Crossing the Chasm, he speaks about technology adoption. And the chasm is where a lot of technology is, a lot of processes die. They never make it to the mainstream. I would suggest today, Agile has crossed the chasm. It is mainstream. And so for the early and late majorities, it's proven for them. It, in fact, if you're in the late majority, you, you do it because everybody else is starting to do it. So it's just, it's in, I guess for a lot of people, it would just be a very practical reason. Agile has a proven successful track record. It has actually worked. There's, there's plenty of data points now that show that when applied properly, Agile actually leads to good business outcomes. And for all of these reasons, I think you're, you're seeing that they're becoming more and more well-known and more and more, as you put it, famous around the world. Sure, sure. Uh, nowadays, people are talking a lot about COVID-19, the exponential growth of technology and their impact on this new market. How do you see the impact of all these changes on the agile thinking? I, I really shouldn't laugh. I mean, COVID has been the ultimate agility stress test. I mean, it is the perfect stress test, unfortunately. Think of it this way. Companies that have lacked agility, uh, they really suffer great harm uh, through all the uncertainty that's been posed by this pandemic and the effects it's had on our economies around the world. Now, think about the companies that over the past several years have embraced sort of core agility. I would suggest many of those companies are doing much better. I mean, think of large tech companies, for example, companies like uh, Amazon and Google and Facebook and Microsoft, you know, the, the large companies, they, they've been agile for a long time. Agile is part of their DNA at this point. They were actually much better prepared when the pandemic hit. And they're doing really well. I mean, maybe even a scary level of good. I mean, some of these companies are now in trillions of dollars, right, in terms of what they're able to generate. But go, go beyond that. Think about even small, even regional, local companies, right? They're, they were very quickly able to pivot. Uh, you know, pivot their business models and in, in their tech systems. Those are these companies are not only surviving. I would suggest to you that they're thriving, whereas their neighbors are failing. I can see that just at local restaurants in the city that I'm in, which is really a small town. 
And some of them are doing actually quite well because they made very quick changes to their business model where others that required people to come in, sit down, have a meal, they're not doing so well. So I would suggest for companies that already began their agile journey, COVID was the stress test on how well they truly embraced agility. Uh, and when they were posed with the need that they really had to pivot quickly um, and the, because the, the operating environment changed, uh, we're getting a real clear picture of which companies are thriving and which aren't. And so I think of COVID, sadly, as shining a pretty bright light on the need for agility. Let's talk about skills, Ken. The World Economic Forum says that hybrid mindset is one of the most important skills to a future professional. How to combine hybrid mindset and agile thinking to reach the excellence on their project management? Uh, okay, so I, I like your use of the word mindset, right? To me, agile is first and foremost a mindset. It's a set of principles. Uh, a set of principles that provides a, a kind of a lens, a lens that brings into focus the situation or the opportunity at hand. And th the beauty of Agile, I would argue, is it gives you that lens, but Agile doesn't tell you how to solve the problem, right? That's up to the practitioners to come up with clever solutions. It does a really good job of finding the problems. Now, the specific approaches that you would use to solve the problems. They they can and they, they should be influenced by other disciplines. I, I mean, so if you think about it, these disciplines provide their own lenses for how they look at a problem. And if we can sort of skillfully combine these different lenses together, we actually get a more powerful view on the problem. I'm, I'm reading a book right now where it's written by a high energy physicist who trans transitioned his skill sets over into biology. And so he, he turned his physicist lens onto biological problems because he felt like he could bring the rigor and the, the mathematics of physics to bear onto biology, which in, in its classical sense, doesn't really focus so much on those core principles. And by combining the two, he and his biology colleagues have made some really interesting discoveries. So I think there's a lot to be said about the hybrid mindset of bringing you know, skills and disciplines together. Agile is one, one lens, but it is not the only lens out there. And I think if we can combine those with other disciplines, uh, we could easily find great discoveries. Great, Ken. Uh, and before we go to the student's question, I would like you to, to leave a great tip, or as we talk here, like a, a hack, a great tip for those who want to start their journey on the agile methodologies and don't know where to start? So great question. Uh, to me, the core principles of agility are where you start. It's back to that mindset again. Uh, you really have to understand the foundational why. Why do we do what we did? So you were kind enough to show my book, right? The Essential Scrum Book. Well, I spent an entire chapter there, chapter three, on core principles, because the belief is this. If you just go off and mechanically apply Scrum, go through all the ceremonies, go through all the motions. Yes, we do planning. Yes, we do a daily Scrum. Yes, we do a review. Yes, we do a retrospective. And you don't understand why you do that. You end up implementing what a lot of people would call cargo cult. Scrum or Cargo Cult Agile. And, and for the listeners who aren't familiar with that, uh, it, it's a, a term that was coined in, in the 1960s. It, it was based on a very simple idea that during World War II, uh, as the war was advancing across the Pacific, uh, the United States would set up forward-looking air bases and they would put them on islands where the people who were native to those islands really had very little interaction with people outside. And, and so what they would notice is that there would be uh, airdrops, cargo would fall from the sky because planes would come over and they would drop food, medical supplies, weapons. And th this was delightful, right? You'd look up and great things fell from the sky. Well, as the war progressed and people in the, in the war moved further to the east or west from our perspective, 
what would end up happening is they would abandon these bases. Well, the, the people on those islands started to replicate the activities they saw the, the Americans doing on this island. So they would build radio huts with a bamboo antenna. They would take a coconut shell, split it in half, put one side here, the other side here to represent a headset for radio. And they would do everything they saw, but yet no cargo came from the sky. And they couldn't figure out why it didn't work. That's cargo called agile. Just blindly doing the practices, a scrum, doesn't mean you understand why you did it. So my first suggestion for anybody who wants to start their journey, understand the core principles that guide agility. Once you understand those principles, and then when you look at something like Scrum or Kanban or anything else, extreme programming, you'll go, ah, now I know why we do that. Not just, I know how to do it. How to do it's easy. Read the book, you'll understand how to do it. But why did you do it? That's what it, chapter three is. It needs to make sense, you know? Absolutely, it has to make sense. Otherwise you'll blindly apply it and you will get the same results. Cargo is not coming from the sky. I think I, I did everything they did, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Great, great, Ken. Let's go to our students' question. I will ask the production. So the first one, Bruna Paiva. It's very common for people to think that agile thinking should be only applied to technology projects. It's a really true that it started with it's it started with it, all right? Uh, it's is it possible to use it to any type of project? So, very good question. It is natural to think about agile as technology. When agile typically enters an organization, uh, most often it will enter through development, through the IT department, something like that. Does it have to be that way? No. Uh, I have used both Scrum and Kanban with marketing teams. I've done it with uh, sales teams, with a variety of teams, like HR. I've worked with them. I've done it with legal teams where we set up an agile process for how they would manage the flow of the legal work that was passing through their organization. Um, I've used Agile to run a homeschool. So the office that I'm in right now, 10 years ago, this used to be a school. Uh, and my two kids were here and we, we for three years, we ran a homeschool. We used a Kanban system to manage the flow of the work in the school, applying the same core principles, the same techniques to something that had nothing technology related. I've used Agile with religious organizations. I've helped a religious, local religious organization manage its outreach work. There was absolutely nothing technical about anything that we did. It would be things like, how will we run the summer camp this year for the local children? Things like that. So if you think about it, Agile itself, there's nothing specific about it that means technology. Yes, it has a natural home in technology, but I've applied it in many, many different areas. So it by no means is technology specific. Let's go to, this, to the second question. Gabriel Lima, I'm looking forward to become an Agile professional, in this case, Agile coach. What advice would you give to someone who wants to reach the next level on his career? So, I love that question. If, you're, if you want to become an Agile coach, let's agree on something immediately. You, ought, you first have to have been an Agile practitioner. All right, no, nobody is going to, to trust a coach who's never played the sport, right? Most great sports coaches have at least been a player. They may not have been the best player ever, but they've played the sport. So you have to have the real world experience, what we would like to say in the trenches, actually doing work that gives you a foundation for actually becoming a coach. Now in the scrum world, what that would mean is you would start first as a scrum master. So you were a practitioner, now maybe you transition, you say, I will now become a coach, a scrum master for let's say one scrum team. And, and then you would work very diligently on your skills with a single team. And then, then you could start to think about scaling it up. If your capacity permitted, perhaps you would be the scrum master for more than one scrum team, especially in an organization that's doing scaling. And eventually what you'll find is that there's a career progression 
meaning you could start as a scrum master. And what you often see as you gain real experience in that role, you can move on to higher levels of coaching, agile coaching within the organization. In a few organizations where I've done work, they'll have a title like enterprise agile coach. And this is somebody who's not really coaching an individual team. What they're doing is they're working almost on end-to-end -end business agility and being a coach there. So if you really want to become an agile coach, become a, first become a good practitioner, understand the mindset, acquire the skills. Of course, you'll want to understand the skills of coaching as well. Uh, now, you can, of course, get training on how to become a good coach, but I think good coaches learn that skill set by practicing it constantly. Uh, and eventually you will start rising uh, within the organization. And even if you choose to do so, become an external agile coach, where you can go work with many different companies, uh, you know, one at a time or at the same time, if you prefer. And a whole, there's a whole equivalent path that someone wanted to become a trainer. Everything starts with practice and studying, all right? Practice all right. and practice and practicing. Let's go to the last one, production, Poliana Oliveira. How do American companies choose between the traditional PMBOK and the agile methodologies on the manage their projects, to manage their projects? No, great question. Uh, so first I would suggest, I, I don't actually sure, I'm not sure that's an American specific question, right? If I think about it, how do people really figure this out? I mean, I, I trained on six, I've trained on six different continents and have had interactions with many, many different companies and many different cultures. And, and yes, some of them are more receptive to that core agile mindset than, than others might be. But my experience is companies make a choice between something like traditional phase-based sequential development, right? The, sort of the PMBOK and agile, they make that choice based on the people that are in place. And what I mean by the people here is I mean senior leadership. Let me give you an example. So in the mid 2000s, Yahoo started adopting Agile. So big company, everybody knows Yahoo. And then they, they had a number of really, really high caliber Agile coaches working with them and they were doing good work within the organization. And then the board of directors makes a change at the very top of the company. New management came in. What did they do? Well, new management was familiar with classic waterfall style development. So all this great work on Agile they had done, gone, just pushed to the side. And then they reverted back to waterfall. Then they started migrating towards Agile again. Management change again, it went up. By the time I got to Yahoo to do training, they were on their third or fourth try with Agile. And when I said to them, I go, do you know, I'm in the classroom, I said, do you know that you folks here at Yahoo have been doing Agile for eight, nine years? And like people are like, no, I had no idea if any of that was happening. So to me, that's not, that's not specific to Yahoo. That's every large company. So if I wanna figure out why an organization chose the approach that it did, it either grew organically if they were a small company, they just started doing something. And that's just the way their culture was born that way. Bigger companies, in my experience, it's almost 100% of the time, the senior leadership that comes in. And it doesn't matter what country that's in. So you could have a great agile company in Europe or in South America, change the leadership and they come in. That's the way the old leadership did it. That's how they did it. I want to do it differently. Forget that waterfall. It's sad, but it's a pattern and it seems to repeat itself quite a bit. Ken, thank you very much, Guy. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm sure everyone, everyone will enjoy it uh, and uh, we, we will have this, this content for our, for our students. It's, it's a great opportunity for everybody. I would like you to share with us or to feel free to share with us uh, how people can find you on the internet, your social medias, your website, or something like this. Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, so uh, my website is uh, inolution.com. Oh, 
There it is. There. Thank yeah. you. I see it on the screen. I don't have to say it. Perfect. Thank you very much again. It was a great pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Obrigado. Obrigado. Tchau, tchau. Tchau. Espero que vocês tenham gostado. Obrigado a todos que participaram. Um grande abraço e até a próxima.